So, how do you feel about the U.S.? Love it? Hate it? Envy it? Admire it? Feel sorry for it? Glad you're not part of it or wish you could be? That question triggers a full range of emotions from Canadians, many of whom visit on vacation, do some business with Americans in America, or simply cross the border uh, to shop for prices and selection that they can't find here in Canada when the currency fluctuations make it worth their while. Well, business writer Diane Francis has a bigger question and a bigger idea for you to consider and to digest. In her new and latest book, The Merger of the Century, she makes an economically compelling case for the two countries to actually merge into one giant united North American powerhouse that she claims is the only way Canada and the U.S. can protect themselves from the economic aggression and growth of Brazil, Russia, India, and China. She's on the line with us from New York today to flesh out the idea and a bit of the framework. How are you, Diane? I'm good. I'm good. I must say, we've known each other for a long time. We've kicked around a lot of economic ideas on the air and off. Boy, you've really done one this time. <laughs> yeah, well, this was uh, this is the, this book is the culmination of four years of what I call a thought experiment. Actually, that's what the book structure is. Uh, it starts really from the basis. I guess I came up with the idea because... Canada faces some serious existential problems, and so does the United States, uh, none the le- least of which is that the wolves are at the door. Uh, state capitalist entities, whether they're China, Russia, or the Arab countries, are bearing down on us, and they're grabbing resources, and they want living standards, and they're really out-competing us in many ways because their companies are backed by their governments, and they can use other diplomatic and other kinds of tools and weapons to get what they want. Um, the other problem is uh, October 4th was the 26th anniversary of the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement, and the border hasn't disappeared as it has in every other place in the world where they started with a free trade agreement like we did. Ours has gotten thicker and worse. I know Canadian manufacturers who have been forced to move to the U.S. because they cannot export through the the, the difficulties in that border, and the border is thickening because of uh, the fact that the two countries have not um, gone down a path of integrating further, faster, such as looking at monetary union, customs union, cross immigration, and all the things that the Europeans, the West Africans, and the Caribbean countries have done. So we're sitting here with a, a internal border problem with our most important trading partner, neighbor, and ally, and an external border problem for the two of us from this new economic cold war, I call it, uh, of state capitalism versus free enterprise. And so these are the existential questions. Then, of course, internally in Canada, we have an aboriginal problem no one ever does anything about. We have a uh, provincial muscle lack of cohesiveness problem. You have Quebec suing Newfoundland to prevent it to sell power to the Americans. You have a BC refusing to allow pipelines so that Alberta can get its oil to Asian markets. So you have a sort of really serious governance problem in Canada, dysfunction, I would say. And then the North has been completely neglected. And the overall question is, can a country as small as Canada hang on to a piece of real estate the size it is, given the fact that the world's greatest buried treasure is in the North and has completely been neglected by the federal government. Uh, if you can, in a nutshell, I mean, there are so many components to this that we could get into from the cultural exchanges and, and otherwise. Just give us a, a thumbnail sketch of the benefit to Canada of doing this. Well, uh, doing this is the operative word, John. My book, and I took four years, and it's hugely researched. I said, okay, now given the existential problems, what makes the most sense? The most sense is pretty, it's a no-brainer. We have to become more partner. We have to in- improve the partnership with the Americans, if not just join and merge into one gigantic country. Uh, that's at one extreme. The other other possibilities, and I have seven merger models, political, and there's, you can do a massive joint venture to develop and protect the North. Uh, remember that the Russians have claimed the Arctic is theirs, and the Chinese want our resources in the North. They've targeted Canada. Um, and, and so you do a joint venture. Do you do a, a German reunification full-on merger where you become 13 states and then you govern together? Or do you move very quickly toward a European Union model where you stay two countries, different cultures, legal 
health care, educate, all those systems mm-hmm. stayed pretty much the same. The Europeans have learned how to do this. Uh, but form another level of fourth level of government that the two countries can govern their two countries on the continental, on the border issues together much better. Um, you know, we've had talks about security perimeter and they're dragging and nothing gets done. 26 years later, we not only didn't get rid of the border between us, we have a worse border. They're protecting it with drones and soldiers, for goodness sake. Okay, but we just stop there. We know how mergers work in companies. If we do that kind of a joint venture, in this case that you just described, who's in charge? Who runs it? Well, you know, that's always the problem. And, and I also remember I'm a business writer. I'm a dual citizen. I love both countries. I see that this isn't a problem. They're already compatible. They love each other. Uh, they, they love, hate each other, and I know that. But uh, I looked at it very coolly as though it was a business proposition. If these two guys were corporations in a declining market with very ruthless competitors and complementary and compatible, what do you do? You merge. So you figure out how to do that. So I did a corporate investment merger model in the book, which is a lot of fun to read. And it looks at valuing the assets, the relative assets the two populations bring. And I, that's where I came up with the figure that Canadians are worth roughly every, every Canadian $500,000 in assets, untapped assets, hmm. more than the Americans. So that would have to be somehow compensated for if it was a business merger. So I just looked at a lot of different things. But Canada has to... And then the last chapter is if the politics are impossible and people want to be, you know, stay where they are and think the status quo is okay, they're wrong. So I have the last chapter is if there's no merger soon, Canada, this is what you're going to have to do. And frankly, the remedies for what Canada has to do to solve its existential problems are going to be more difficult than, than partnering up in a more integrated way with the Americans. All right. What are some of those examples there? Consequences to Canada? And well, you have, to have a real, you have to have a military that can protect a piece of real estate this size. Not that we're going to face invasion soon, but you can't have a military smaller than Singapore's. You can't have a Navy with 8,500 people and two subs that work out of four uh, with the largest coastlines on the planet. You just can't. And we tell the Americans to stay out of our waters in the Arctic. And, you know, they sneak around and they're there. And we have NORAD and all that stuff, NATO. But, you know... It, as as Jack Granitstein said, and I quoted in the book, uh, he's a Canadian nationalist, but you're not really a sovereign country if you can't defend yourself. And and so and economically, the integration is huge. And also, Canadians are merging as we speak, intermarrying, studying uh, the largest buyers of real estate in the United States, the, apart from Americans, are Canadians. Three million Canadians live in the U.S. That's nine percent of the population of the country. So, you know, you have all this going on. The politics is the problem. I have a whole chapter on that. And, you know, that's always the problem. In a corporate merger, mergers fall apart because they fight over who's going to be the CEO. Mm-hmm. That's what happens. Yeah. Well, in this case, I know it's a thought experiment, so it's theoretical at, at the time. But, you know, it just when you put the question out, which I have to, you know, family, friends, and others just in the office here, it's like, are you kidding? Not a chance. I mean, just yeah. that whole... Cultural exactly. No, no, no. Is... There's no question about it. And and the Americans down here that I've talked to, so they they either say, "Wow, what a terrific idea," or they say, "Why would Canada want to join us? We're a mess." Yeah. So so the point is that uh, there are huge benefits. It's so obvious. It's a no brainer. But yes, there is that reaction. Now I will also point out to you, I was around and you were too. Not a lot of Canadians, but in 1985 when Donald McDonald a liberal cabinet minister appointed by Trudeau, spent three years studying on what Canada had to do because it was a nightmare. It was a mess in Canada. And in 1985, he came out with a, uh, a shocking idea, and that was Canada's only hope economically going forward was free trade with the Americans. Same exact reaction. Recoil. Oh, my God. Hordes. We'll lose everything. Our identity will be absorbed. Blah, 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 blah. And, you know, the first elected official to break ranks and say, no, this is a great idea, was Jacques Perizzo, the separatist. Then, yeah. then Mulroney changed his mind, and, you know, two years later the deal was signed. And economically it's been a terrific, it's been an absolutely se- sensational success. It's been disruptive, but it's been a huge success, and I dread to think what Canada would look like if we hadn't done that. But we have the border problem now because of the amount of drug smuggling and concern about terrorist activities that could come out of Canada. And that's why the Americans are militarizing our border. And that's creating huge problems. They're requiring passports and so on. And 
If you think that's all overblown and paranoid, consider the fact the first Al-Qaeda attack was mounted out of Montreal mm. by an Algerian terrorist named Ahmed Ressam, who I reported to authorities two years before was in the country because I was tipped off by Interpol. Nothing was done, and fortunately he was caught at the border in Washington State on his way to blow up the L.A. airport. So we and the largest aviation terrorist attack in history was the Air India attack out of Toronto. And so to think that we don't have a security issue and to think that we're not, you know, joined at the hip with the Americans and have to do some more collaboration is a very naive notion. No, I've always thought if America ever got to the point where they really considered their national defense to be, um, you know, at, at threat because of Canada, they'd just annex us, you know. Well, they could have done that for over 200 years, you know, and uh, that's not what that's not the nature of the beast. I mean, uh, Canada wouldn't exist if America had really wanted to take it over because of the military, you know, uh, size of it. But the, but they're they're good neighbors. I mean, of course, I'm a dual citizen. I'm American and Canadian. I think they're both really terrific people. So <laughs> I don't see them as a threat. I just say Canadians have to, and they will. Canadians are very circumspect and very smart. So what's going to happen is happen in the free trade thing. And in the free trade thing, there's immediate reaction and recoil, sort of at the level of a football game, you know, name-calling and silliness. And then people start to study it and think about it. Then there's a real debate. Then it gets in the public domain. Then we had an election, and it was a close election. But, you know, the polling showed all the way along the line 50-50, and and the, the free trade side won. Uh, despite, you know, absolutely scurrilous statements by John Turner and others that we were going to lose health care and pensions immediately, you know, and of course that's silly. But, you know, you mentioned Jacques Perizzo, and not to prolong this, but it's, it is interesting. How, you know, how does this happen with Quebec and with, uh, you know, Native, Native Canadians? It's, I'm not so sure, even though Perizzo bought into the free trade notion and was one of the first to, to be a visionary about it, this whole country has been coping with Quebec and Native Canadians internally. How the hell does it ever do it externally? Yeah, well, uh, he he went for it because he wanted to be less dependent on English Canada economically, and uh, and he also uh, and you know and and there is a very lively. I'm going to be writing about this down the road, but there's a very lively French Canadian movement uh, in in that that wants annexation that is fed up with the Canadian back and forth and silliness, and they hate the independence movement and all that sort of thing. So that's interesting. The other thing that's interesting is that most Canadians don't realize that under a treaty in the 19th century, First Nations in Canada are dual citizens. They are American citizens as well as Canadians. And if they have something to say on a united front, that might be very interesting. And I have interviewed in this book a number of the chiefs, and they're they're very disillusioned with the Canadian thing. So th- that's that's an interesting phenomenon as well. Two currencies or one? Oh, you have to have one. I think we, whether you merge or not, I mean, we should be studying monetary union. We have a Dutch disease problem. Our manufacturing and tourism has been absolutely killed because our dollar is near parity because of commodity prices and the fact that we're really mostly exporting, you know, commodities to the rest of the world. Uh, and you know that is just killing uh, a lot of our of our economic activity and forcing a lot of manufacturing to the U.S. or to other markets. And so you know we've got if if you have one currency, uh, then then the the activity the economic activity ignores the border and goes where it makes the most sense. And so, but it has to be studied. And you know because you don't want to do what the eurozone did, and that is you know roll it out very stupidly. Uh, then you need a you need a common central bank and you need all kinds of other things. So it's it's a big it's a big undertaking, but it's something the Caribbean has done it, West Africa's done it, seventeen of the twenty seven European countries have done it. Um, to me again it's it's just very sensible and it, it really adds to the cost of doing business in Canada. Well it is as you say a big idea and thought experiment. So we uh, thank you for sharing it with us and we'll direct folks to the, the book if they'd like to delve into it more. Yeah, I really urge people not to just to to vote up or down on the idea of merging with the U.S. There's a zillion models, and I lay out the existential problems. Canadians who really care about the future of their country should read this book. 
I really should, because I've put it all together, just like Donald McDonald did in 1985. These are the options. This is what works. This is what won't work. This is where we are, because the world has changed dramatically since 1985. Thanks, Doug. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.